Okay, welcome, and welcome to the delegation of our friends from architecture and the Naval schools, and we oblige them to come to this meeting, and they're super happy to come and listen to this conference. I'll say yes, please. Okay, um, well, Lorenzo Damiani, Giovanna Castiglioni, will the title of the meeting of tonight. Uh, it was called Senza Stile, and it was a exhibition held during the Salone del Mobile at the Design Week at the Foundation Studio Museum, and she's a founder of the museum, Giovanna Castiglia. Well, uh, Lorenzo Damiani is a friend of the school, because uh, we can say we know him and follow him since a very long time. We're super happy he's here right now. Uh, and he has studied here in a master course a few years ago. And I say a friend of the school uh, in 1999. And with him, it will be definitely a pleasure to speak about his works and about his design. It's, uh, well, let me just say a special design which has to be understood and spoken about immediately and really well. Um, it has a lot of uh, contact with and links with the, a master like Achille Castiglione. And this is the reason why, and the sort of elective affinity that has been created between time, between a meeting uh, that has occurred between a teacher and the scholar. Uh, well, they have created one of the best exhibitions that were held during the Salone del Mobile. To speak about this topic, let me just show you a video which lasts two minutes, which was done by Francesca Montini on the exhibition, the actors of this exhi exhibition. So if you haven't seen it, you can understand the soul of this project. There is a technical problem, just a second. Okay. Thank you. 
Well, this, for those of you who haven't seen it, well, was just the, uh, an idea of what occurred during the exhibition. It was a very nice exhibition that was putting together uh, this ping pong between the design and the works of Achille Castiglione and the design and the ideas and certain objects done by Lorenzo, all present in one unique magic place that you all know about, which is the Castiglione Studio. When did you meet Achille Castiglione? Uh, wow, what a question. I mean, when did I really meet him? Um, when I was studying in university, or maybe before? Because, no, no, actually, he has never been my teacher. Well, I actually remember that I had, well, I studied in Polytechnico, and uh, I remember he used, because when I used to study in Polytechnico, he was not a teacher anymore. Um, but I remember that, uh, I think it was a master course, or he came uh, in my class to do a lecture and um, with all his objects and there were so many people, you know, I just uh, listened to the lecture from outside the door of the classroom. I mean, I didn't really hear much and didn't see very much. Uh, and. Um, when I wrote my thesis, I had the, the luck to go to his studio, meet him for like an hour or just a few hours more, and then I met Giovanna as well. And, and with Giovanna, well, and then we'll let uh, Lorenzo speak about his works, and with uh, Giovanna, this exhibition originally, right, which will be the first of a several, right, uh, on a format which is dedicated to opening the studio to new designers, or designers, new designers, but designers, in theory, of designers which are uh, maybe close to what uh, is the location of the place in the studio. Definitely that has been an incident which has been pretty fascinating for the foundation because opening our doors of, a, of our studio for those of you who came and visit you know what I'm talking about it's full of objects of Castiglione not only also anonymous objects and inserting in this place in this location some objects of a designer has a logic, a sense, an affection towards his projects and his design objects. It's not so easy to do an exhibition in the future. I mean, uh, for sure, the foundation nowadays is definitely working to open its doors to the young and the less young designers. The importance is that they're curious designers. Um, correct? Uh, what do you mean less young? I mean, am I between the less young? Yes, we're so tired of speaking about these young designers. You're a young designer. Well, we met speaking about young designers. What this thing, young designer? And are you a young designer or not a young designer? What does young designer mean? Do you have an age to design? And since my father died when he was 83 years old and he was still super young until the end, I must say to speak about young and old, we shouldn't ever speak about that, especially in design. And uh, projects and, uh, uh, need to be timeless, need to remain in our hearts and our minds and uh, in our hands for very many years. You don't need a young designer, who cares? Uh, the, the challenge of our foundation will be that of opening our doors to uh, people, let's call them like this, that have the will of inserting themselves and they're in those four rooms that you've seen like full and packed with objects Lorenzo entered in tippy toes because he's definitely a gentleman uh, since he's from Lombardy and he has his under he's understated and just tippy toed inside I mean I'm not saying this just because he's here of course there's this feeling between him and Castiglione and we will show you through through his design through his presentation now you will see the feeling is there with this title that you have chosen without a smile and uh, it works so perfectly I mean the lecture needs to have this title there's no title let's get the, the word to learn to them, yeah. and then we will interrupt him in time, and you have to do that as well, because the purpose of all this is to do things all together.
Well, first of all, I must say that uh, uh, a memory that I have when I went to speak with uh, Giovanna's father, well, I was uh, 23, 24 years old, and I was realizing that I was facing a person that physically was definitely older than me, but in terms of mind and thoughts, I mean, he was much younger than me. He was definitely much quicker and smarter than me. Just to go back with the, the, the conversation regarding about young designers and not, I mean, it makes no sense to speak about young designers. And speaking about the title, uh, without style, well, it's uh, an idea of Giovanna, and I've liked it immediately. And, and well, this, uh, we were playing with this idea of the, the ambiguity of the title without style. I prepared a presentation to show you what has been the display and the design of the exhibition itself. And I have divided, just like I usually do, uh, several projects into um, different families just to describe them a bit better, just according to the projectual approach that I have used. Well, here there are a few images of the exhibition itself, or there are some objects that I will describe later on. Before we were speaking about the uh, tippy-toeing inside this Castellano studio, well, I have worked in a very natural manner. I mean, besides the fact that we definitely have a, a, a tuning, we have the same kind of ideas on how to do everything, but uh, I believe it was, I mean, I took that for granted. Being in a place like that, uh, I mean, I, I did this in a very um, tippy-toeing manner. And um, I think you can really tell this. I mean, there's a various images of... Uh, now, I'm not telling you everything, because later on I will focus on the different projects. The only image which is actually missing later on is this um, um, tap. Well, this is still a prototype. Uh, well, actually, it was what was presented during the Salone del Mobile, done for Ceramicas Flaminia, that I will explain later on very quickly. What I want to explain to you, for example, is this project, because all the objects displayed uh, at the Castiglione Museum well, are some objects that I had and I brought into this place to show and exhibit. But when I entered the bathroom the first time, the first thing I saw immediately was the floor the floor of the bathroom, I mean, the, of the toilet, because it was and it is fantastic. It's like a natural chessboard made of black and white uh, uh, tiles. And at, I had just this idea to just uh, do a, a, like a sort of game, something a bit playful, an object that does not have any sense if it's moved somewhere else. And in fact, they want to keep this, and they want to keep this, and this is a present for me in the sense that it's nothing else but a frame. Do you see this frame? Okay, this frame that detached from the uh, wall and positioned on the floor transforms the place, the architecture, into an object. And therefore, I like this possibility of interacting with the place and the object designed. Well, and then there's also the, the, the chess pieces that are just there inside the frame. Beside the shape, I w I'd like you to see the relation between the object and the space. And this is the only object that was designed just for the exhibition itself. Well, of course, and you can really tell that you're an architect because you're speaking about space. Well, objects, of course, have to be seen in relation to a space, and what they, of course, have to relate with the space. I told you, um, I divide project into some, uh, like, like in macro families that sometimes overlap one with the other and contaminate one with the other, but I like to divide them this way, and therefore it's a very subjective and personal division. I, these are the projects, behavioral projects. Well, behavioral projects are, for example, this lamp that I have designed in 1995. And at the end of the long run, this is a project that brought me a lot of luck because I remember when I designed this, everybody um, 
thought that I was a half idiot when I did this because um, it was a historical moment when thinking of a second life of an object or eventually thinking of uh, um, the future of uh, things that we have and own, well, it was a bit anachronistic and uh, rather this project originated from that, which is called Fight, and it is just a thought on what could happen to a packaging. And in fact, usually when you purchase a light bulb in the mass distribution, well, usually the client can choose if he wants to trash the packaging and just use the light bulb, or eventually or, well, he has always done this, actually. Rather, with this idea, he could actually choose if he could just trash the packaging or eventually transform that into a true lamp. And I thought this could be interesting, not for the fact that, um, you know, the blister that could be recuperated, but actually, it's... Can you all hear me without a microphone? Well, the thing that I was uh, concerned with this, of this idea, was the fact of um, having the user uh, come up with the idea that he could eventually rethink and re-see and reinterpret the entire world of uh, the packagings and reuse them in some way. If this blister, I can reuse it without trashing it, maybe I can do this with several other objects. In reality, this was the true project. Actually try to have people enter this train of thought of reusing packagings or eventually things that they used to trash. This is why I call it a behavioral project. It should go and review and reinterpret the usual behaviors of people. Maybe it's a bit exaggerated, my thought, but that was the idea behind this project. Well, uh, Johanna was just telling me that Achille Castiglione and, and Adi uh, gave him the Compasso d'Oro uh, for this project in those years. And uh, let me just uh, add, uh, well, I believe two years later in 97, well, this was uh, shown and exhibited in August in uh, 97, yes, because you start with this, uh, your career starts in 95, right, with backlight, right? Yes, more or less, 95, yes, my career starts. I want to point out Opus, because probably none of you know who Opus has been. That has been a very important reality in Milan in the last 10 years, and it has supported all young designers with exhibitions and uh, different initiatives, and that all started from the free will of a person who didn't work in design at all, but he loved design, it was his passion. And, uh, well, uh, there are some people who say Opus has been the drug design, the Italian drug design. Um, those people who participated to Opus did things that were less strong, strong in the sense that uh, impactful. And, uh, in terms of reasoning, in terms of design, uh, uh, and certain ideas, they were the, the 90s, right? The environment, certain matters, right? Well, uh, I, well this reminds me, and we're, they're the same years, and it, it reminds the, the, the beginnings of drug design. Well, no, 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 actually, uh, behind Opus, there was uh, this machinate uh, that's uh, called Alberto Zanone. He had uh, a knitwear industry in Biella, didn't know anything about design, but he offered a, a space of 100 meters square to do this exhibition during Salone del Mobile, when Fori Salone didn't really exist at the time. And therefore, you'd see these buses of German who would come to this space and say, how did these people know about this? Because it was a very well-known reality in foreign countries, but in Italy, people didn't really know what it was. And the comparison with drug design, well, the comparison is that uh, um, the if we have to put this on a balance and an equation, well, drug design could have some financiators that in Italy did not have, and Opus did not have, and therefore it died out. But it was definitely a good training for all of us. And here you can all see the packaging of the mass distribution, which is then transformed and so on. 
this is um, it's a scotch tape. It's a scotch tape which has generated also a, a ribbon to do um, packaging for present and gifts. Sometimes I try to recycle objects 100% until I had this idea. I finally managed to do to recycle 100%. I think that you all have received a recycled present. It always has happened to one of us, right? And therefore, I told myself, well, why, you know, this behavior of recycling present, why can't this become a way to recycle all those objects that we trash? If you give me a sweater and I don't like it, I'll keep it three years in the wardrobe and then trash it, right? Rather, Ali Filipini could love it. And why not give it, like, recycle the present and put this in cycle again and just rather have Ali Filipini buy another one, get this one? Well, this is the sense of this idea and this ribbon, which is called recycled 100% present. And it means 100% sustainability because recycling a present is sustainable. And you are avoiding to be embarrassed because you're doing it, you're stating it, right? And you are claiming that this is a recycled present. This is a project, a behavioral project. This is, it's not a project itself, it's just a ribbon, right? Well, he started with a more conceptual project because this is, uh, uh, I mean, explain this to us. Well, this originated uh, in my house, exactly, because it's, it's all started there. Projects usually occur by just, and come up with looking at behaviors, right? And what happens? When we had a guest, at the end, well, of course, I used to have all the broken dishes because to give the guest the best dish, right? The best plate. And, and this is true, you know, when uh, they were all broken, I said, oh my God, here we need an idea because either I go buy a new set of plates or else I need to use these broken ones. And therefore I said, well, why not have this problem or this uh, uh, crack be uh, a way of originating a new idea, a new project? And therefore, just simply fighting a adequate polish, it was possible to just repaint those broken cracks, which have just made this plate reusable in the sense this is of course it's not an idea just of course to reuse your broken dishes or whatever and uh, like our uncle zia maria or aunt maria to use this right but um it's just to avoid to uh putting uh, consuming other goods and this in this way i'm not purchasing a new set of dishes but i'm using mine and frequently it has occurred that they asked me to purchase some plates which were painted by me i never sold these because this project of course i will not sell the plate or set of plates just simply it promotes a behavior which is different and therefore in this case well i showed some plates it doesn't matter. I mean, the plate could be square, rectangular, could be a sphere, but it could be just a, a brick, a jug, a mug, anything. And it was just an idea. And this is a project called Rethought, Ripensa. And this is a project that just looks at behaviors because um, some plates have been done on purpose with some cracks. But this is another type of project because this is actually more looking into the imperfection. Do you remember? In Casa Castiglioni, what happened in my house? You know what Achille Castiglioni used to do? Well, in my house, we used to keep the cracked dishes and broken dishes, and we'd keep those. And when you were nervous, you had these black days, horrible days, and I mean, you had that broken dish. My mom said, go get the dish. There's a dish, break it. 
and probably my own dad would have liked the concept of not breaking things, but actually reuse them, retouch them in some way, rather I just break them to, uh, of course, and pick up all those and you just really take that away. I mean, different behaviors. This is another type of thought, living the existent. Well, I went to Murano to do some projects and uh, I realized that, that there was an entire world to discover also for what concerns the waste and the leftovers. This is why I have ins inserted the project in reliving the existing. And uh, well, I created this bowl called 152. This bowl well, originates uh, thinking of the leftovers, the wastes. If you purchase any Murano vase and just you just break it by accident, it would become just uh, a special waste. Uh, what do I mean by this? That to waste this and to trash it, you have to go through several standard processing that are very expensive. And I thought, well, why not have this problem become another source of inspiration to create a new project? And therefore, the idea of creating a sort of bowl, which is this, with a sort of double chamber, it has like a vacuum in it, and you insert all the leftovers in this. Inserting all these wastes and closing the bowl, well, the final user never um, gets in contact with these special wastes, and uh, um, in this way, what was I concerned about this project? Not the fact, of course, yes, the shape, it has to be pleasant to see and aesthetically pleasant, but what I was concerned about was to propose an alternative to waste these special products. Because this is called the 152 Bowl, which is the name of the legislative decrees that regulates the norm regarding the wasting of these special waste. Uh, did I get lost? What was I saying? It's called 152. Yeah, okay. And uh, the name of the bowl. Give me a vowel, please, a consonant. Um, well, okay. Um, I called it 152 because um, I thought that at the end, just it was pretty interesting just closing it into this name of the decrease. So, an involunteer decoration. You're trying to decorate through a non-decoration, basically. Yeah, but a decoration, non-decoration? Yeah. Show us the detail. Here it is. Uh, it looks like candies. I, every time I look at this, I just want to eat one of these. Well, here the interesting part is that they are we are reusing some fragments of memory inside. You can see some leaves, you can see some animals, uh, all made of glass, some Murano glass. Well, of course, if you take these individually, I mean, they're super kitsch, I mean, they're super ugly, honestly. But put together, they lose their identity and they acquire another, and they acquire a greater strength, a greater aesthetic, uh, uh, more pleasant unity and the bowl is nothing else than a big tank where you're inserting all these objects together this other project rather it's uh, uh, once again uh, stealing some uh, other objects because um, when an object is already well designed sometimes it's useless to do another one and therefore, very frequently, I like to steal some objects, which, how can I say, in their specific field, there are some subjects, but I am extrapolating, bringing them to another dimension to make these become some components of a bigger puzzle. And this is the situation exactly from, for this sink called H2O, totally made of plastic. It steals this, uh, see this shape? This is a bucket already in production, 
And in my particular case, it becomes the component of a sink totally made of plastic that should cost just a few euros. Then, of course, very few compared to a sink made in uh, ceramics. So it has, it's totally complete with, uh, it's totally functional, functioning. It reminds me uh, of someone, this fact of taking an object and extrapolating it to a different life and you, why isn't it working? Everything, it's okay, it doesn't matter. Stay. Uh, well, yeah, well, uh, Castiglione was working on the ready-made, and so taking things which are already existing, and especially I'm thinking of when you're speaking of the industrial design that we're used to listening as a term, which is an English term for Castiglione, has always been industrial production. Um, a lot of numbers, zero production, low cost, anyone can have and own one of these and Lorenzo Damiani can enter in anyone's home. This is actually the advantage of doing pieces which are of design which are so simple you have no words to describe these because it's really an industrial production. Yes, in fact, I wanted to underline this, right, the fact of a daily object which is borrowed and uh, it's just modified slightly, and this is exactly uh, in your way of doing, in your DNA. And it was exactly how Achille Castiglione was looking at things, giving a second life to things by using his smartness, like his uh, idea, and give a second life to these objects, and he'd find them a bit everywhere. Well, he was definitely a master in doing this. Of course, well, um, it, this is not a comparison. We're not comparing you to Achille Castiglione and uh, no one has ever said ready-made for your projects and it's correct not to call them ready-made but uh, uh, this is another project that starts with the same logic uh, stealing the component from another sector to eventually using it in the furniture and uh, this is a project that I have presented at Salone Satellite in 2003 and uh, well, it was creating just some small structures on which one could sit. And the fun part is that, uh, um, well, yes, we did design these projects, but very frequently I had to build them uh, in uh, Brico centers, or and of course it was becoming also a construction, like uh, with the people who were going around these uh, uh, places, right? And these were some particular projects that and had a. This is another project that originated. Well, I started. Um, well, very, very frequently when I design, well, uh, I try to, how can I say, uh, well, I try to see things that uh, should not be done. Uh, and I ask myself, we shouldn't do this. And it has never been done because you shouldn't do it because there's a reason not to do it or it's simply because it's a convention, no one taught about it or... And in 2004, 2005, I can't remember exactly, but I tried to understand how to bend tubes that had a square or a circular uh, section without using molds or anything. And therefore, this idea originated due to the fact that going around with my car, I saw after a um, there was a, a lamp, uh, that was bent naturally after this big storm, probably it was hit by a thunder or something. And uh, uh, initially, well, uh, I did a handle, a handle which, uh, uh, well, bending it, it had created this point exactly, uh, just by auto-generation, self-generation, well, it created a point that when you design a handle, 
um, the designer very frequently is thinking about the streamline, the ergonomy, how do you use it, where does your thumb go, and obviously with this fold there was this space where you could put your thumb. So a handle with this type of fold had an aesthetic fold but a functional fold at the same time and therefore in the other projects when I use this kind of fold for the material well I have done this yes aesthetically but especially functional because I wanted the two things to go uh, side by side and therefore this for Ceramica Flaminia this tap was uh, design. In this case, the fact of the fold, beside of being aesthetically pleasant, it's also functional. When you design a tap, well, inside the tube, to diminish the pressure, well, there are some walls that break the water, to break the pressure. And these folds break the pressure naturally. It's as if internally, well, visually you see what happens inside the tube usually and it was pretty interesting to use the fold for this purpose and then I've done some other accessories some other tables but always playing on the aesthetic functions of these folds well there is this other project which is also the cover page of the exhibition. Well, the idea originated because Osram asked me to do a promotional object, and uh, so usually, well, they had uh, some promotional objects where these objects were placed like in a matchbox and something a bit ugly in the sense that who is looking at these promotional objects well you'd open it once close it and then trash everything um, rather I wanted this promotional object to become uh, like a man a person and therefore I just created the idea just taking and cutting and just uh, making these wires, legs and arms of uh, Omolux. Omolux is just this little man found his blister but did not find his production because Azram at a certain point told me, well, we don't really like it and therefore everything finished. But very frequently the majority of the objects that I show you have never found a true brand, a true company that produces them. Well, let me just speak about this. Well, you have worked from the real beginning, right? You self-produced uh, a, a lot of your objects. You have chosen self-production uh, to exist in the market. And, well, uh, frequently we speak about self-production lately due to the fact that there is uh, this idea of uh, giving great interest to the world uh, of the 3D printers, the makers, the fab labs and so on, right? Therefore, there is a return to the world of self-production. But uh, of self-production, well, you have chosen to self-produce your projects. Well, it's very many years that we speak about you as a designer who self-produces his own design pieces. This is a choice and a way of existing, right? Therefore, Tappellini, right? You have done some things immediately with uh, some various brands. But continuing to speak about your projects, please tell us about this aspect. Well, self-production has been fundamental. Um, let's say at the real beginning and uh, as well as uh, nowadays i mean uh, with brands it's very hard to dialogue and in fact in those moments when you go and propose objects which are particular i don't really see my projects particular but uh, they might have some ideas which are not just form and therefore they've got an idea embedded in them and when you start proposing certain objects, companies just take a step back and just at a certain point it just was natural to self-produce certain objects. Like for example, if this object originated for a 
a competition for Osram. Well, it's also true that Osram told me no, but we don't really uh, are not concerned with this. It was just uh, an advertising. And this has occurred that after a few years, well, the communication uh, and marketing uh, office of Osram said, but who did you do this for? Well, changing the people, well, they didn't know that they designed it for Osram. And therefore, this is one thing that happens for very many projects that I've done, where the, the relation with the artisans has been fundamental. And, well, of course, I do design, I design a lot, but uh, very frequently the project originates in relation with the material, in relation with working with your hands, with the several artisans in different know-how that are part of the project. Uh, for example, with this chair, which has the seat padded with the, uh, pieces of wood, and like wood power and uh, due to the fact that it's uh, i worked uh, with the district that that made chair and they did chairs made of wood they wanted he wanted to use this leftover of wood to participate to the competition all these people did their chairs and then the leftovers of their chair he took it and did his the padding for his uh, for his own chair and once again, a way of trying to showing certain materials with a different kind of ideas. Besides the chair, you might like it or not, but it's an idea at the base of this. Or they're tippy toeing objects. In Punta di Piedi means uh, tippy toeing, and uh, it's just like the display that I've done in Giovanna's uh, Castiglione studio. Um, there is the sink, which is part of a collection of different taps, uh, where um, they asked me to design a tap. And, uh, well, it was the first time. And I said, okay, let me just try. But I've never designed a tap. And they said, oh my god. Uh, well, very good. I mean, better. You come with totally different ideas. Uh, uh, totally virgin according to a point of view uh, of sinks and uh, taps and everything and uh, this project that tries to um, simplify I don't really like this word but it tries to take in consideration what is that uh, those gestures that are involved while you use a tap and especially, it tries to simplify it, generating the very simple, uh, it's nothing else but a joystick that you move, that moves right or left, and like this, you select the warm water, cold water, and the quantity of water as well. And therefore, behind this idea, there was, of course, some an engineering and engineerization of this product because of course you had to work on some aspects that had never been taken in consideration like uh, water which is too warm and uh, due to the fact that it's an industrial design product well i found myself working with several people at the technical offices and engineers and i was basically the the, the the one who just had to indicate the direction of their work that was pretty interesting because in that way you realize on how thanks to the other people's competences and know how you reach a better result and uh, it's evident that to create an object uh, which is of this kind, you need very many people and different know-hows. And uh, this is a thought that can be done both on an industrial product, but also on artisan's production. Very many times we go to an artisan and he is the one who maybe can give you some uh, information some advice and uh, he said oh yeah that's right it's true rather there are some artisans that you go there and they tell you oh no you can't do that i mean it's impossible of course you need to read the 
like in between the lines and try to understand to whom you can go and yes I mean I heard this you oh no it's impossible so many times from artisans and I will explain to you I oh, know architect sorry this cannot be done but um, this is exactly what I like about your work I mean you do the paint just to retouch your plates which are cracked and then you expect him to get lost and all these things and then he does this uh, very industrial tab spending two years uh, like with all these engineers and these technicians uh, and uh, on how to do that idea and that's Lorenzo Damiani well uh, there I always say it was fundamental to go there with uh, a maquette because um, Usually, when I am called by a company, well, I say I go there with at least two proposals. Maybe I like this, and maybe I like the other. Of course, I need to like them both, because or else I won't show them. Because it happens very frequent that you cannot manage to do what they ask you. And in the case of the tap, I remember I had this idea, but I said, oh, well, I'll try to present this prepared all his rendering and everything uh, but I realized that uh, well I if I was showing them just the drawings well they'd say oh huh, yeah interesting mm, okay but that's it rather when at a certain point I show them a model of a cat well, they understood they lit up totally I mean uh, it was there with scotch tape and you could see it that it was not really well not done of course I did not want a perfect tap there to to show them I want them to understand the gestures that could not originate in this idea and then when they started working with this and using it as a joystick they said huh we can try this and it all started from that just to tell you how important it is to come uh, and go to these meetings with a maquette uh, and not with all your super mega drawings of 3D and a lot of different reflections and perfect lights. This is rather, another company asked me to design a wardrobe with sliding doors and um, well I proposed the, this uh, with several mechanisms, well, I said, what can I do to design a new wardrobe? Because in the majority of the cases, I mean, when you design a wardrobe like this, well, in the long run, well, the project, in the long run is designing the, the, the door of them, right? And the majority of these cases, well, is just giving uh, just new aesthetics. But I was thinking, well, I'd like to manage to give it a functional valence as well, not only an aesthetic valence. And to see what happens in my house, well, this idea originated. Well, I see that in my house, well, there are the doors of the wardrobe with some uh, keys and where I usually put the hanger right on them. And so I said, well, I created this to uh, give the possibility to hang all the hangers and therefore the door is like a very big and long hanger and and this was the small little idea that uh, had this wardrobe originated and there are some stronger ideas and some projects that has just some small little ideas. I always think that the importance is that there's always a functional idea linked to this. Well, uh, of course, doing a project is always very complex and you can manage to do it and so this is another project. Well, this originated a few years ago and nothing what can i just say about this well i thought to design some felt some you know those sticky felts that you put for protection i said well it would be nice to manage to design a felt giving it a new um, how can i say with a new idea and 
the typology just uh, was pretty interesting. I mean, if we all always design a chair, there's an incredible competition, right? In the world of chairs, there's so many chairs. And everything has been done. Rather, there are some niches of project where designers have never worked on and therefore certainly uh, felts have been the first i mean i believe uh no designer really worked on this i believe i has been the first designer who has done a sticky felt because doing this is just an archetype that uh, it's an object which is pretty anonymous and uh, those that Aquila would have just collection, collected, right? Here the project is, is in the idea of what happens when you use this, right? And you usually buy it, right? A bigger dimension and then you had to cut it, creating the right dimension for yourself, right? Rather in this case, well, the felt is already pre-cut and you can choose the dimension that you're more concerned with. And the interesting is that you have a part to use eventually in another moment. And you can say, oh, okay, well, I mean, that's not this big deal. But at the long run, if you use this, well, of course, it's not that uh, trashing a piece of felt, something happens, but but it's always that mental mechanism that I believe a designer should have. And it's always very interesting to communicate this to the final user. If the final user understand that certain projects are done, thought to be used with uh, attention. And here you see. Marco Romanelli uh, wrote uh, a critics on this in occasion of the exhibition that you have done in Triennale a few years ago. Well, well, Marco is a brother, and Marco says that uh, he belongs to the time that he spends more time in Meazza or in uh, Brico more than in other places, uh, more than. And there is where you get the true idea and where the true inventor originates. It's like Home Depot, Rico, and uh, just to give you an idea. And therefore, he spends more time there than in any other place. And he's the true inventor. This is what Marco Romanelli said about Lorenzo da Vinci. And uh, there is, of course, space for everyone. I'm not saying that everyone has to rush to Home Depot and come up with ideas, but uh, um, he goes to Home Depot every two seconds. Every city he goes, uh, he went to, I'm speaking of uh, Achille Castiglioni, where he used to go to the food store and uh, to the places where he'd buy chocolate immediately. And the other thing was going into all those uh, utility stores and uh, Home Depot and things like that. And um, design originates from those things, observing all those small little objects. It's not very many designers who follow this kind of school, right? Um, uh, the Fioravanti is another designer who does that and has a strong look. And Achille Castiglione, of course, had that. You had to look at the Brico at the Home Depot shelves to learn. Well, with this logic, another project originates, well, which is this in reality. It's an object of the, the it's this brush. Well, it's still a prototype, okay, so uh, please, uh, it's, of course, uh, it, it's fragile and now it's just a prototype. They're uh, debating on who's uh, So I imagine that some of you have ever tried to open a can of paint, right? And very frequently you do that with a screwdriver, with anything. I mean, you need a, a tool. And so the idea was that of using a brush with that tool to open the can. So in this way, 
and it's an idea which is pretty simple but it didn't exist and in the long run uh, well I believe that projects have to originate where there is a need it is pretty interesting to design anything and uh, maybe you use a certain kind of object and this creates a, I mean, you say oh my god why the heck does this not work and this is the nice aspect of creating a new project and a new design and then obviously it's a very simple idea but it's a few years that I'm trying to create some objects of this kind it's very many years that I'm trying to design a hammer I didn't manage to do the, that because it's very very hard to design a hammer that makes sense to be designed I mean, it's there to do some, I mean, it has to be interesting, right? And it has to be different from those. It's easy to do a hammer, of course, with uh, another function, but that doesn't really make sense. You're waiting for that moment where you get the idea? No, it's not that I'm just staring at a white wall and just uh, hoping for an idea, but it has never happened to me I mean it has never happened to me like someone says hi oh, you know I just sleep uh, with the little book I wake up in the middle of the night and I start drawing it has never happened to me once I mean I'd pay gold and gold and all the gold in the world to get an idea like that I need to go there I mean focus and think research maybe okay you're under the shower and maybe you're there or you're walking around to get the illumination but it's because you're thinking about that I mean you're prepared you're you're studying about the topic it's not that you just get the inspiration like that I mean this is my idea there's also another factor speaking about Lorenz and knowing him more and more deeply well, designers nowadays need to have a challenge and they have to try to design and this is probably the hardest part to do well, uh, of course you're trying to uh, have companies that pick up these challenges well with this brush I was thinking very ingeniously that uh, going to a company they just say wow here's the red carpet for you because I said well no designer has ever designed a brush or uh, it's just few and so I called a few of the different companies and with great surprise they said Oh, no, they didn't really interest, uh, they were not interested, they didn't want to speak to me on the phone either. And certain companies still think that the work of the designer is that of proposing uh, uh, a different color to the handle and do the nice little brush that they don't really care. And so I had to face these realities as well. And this is something that happens daily actually. Uh, you do 100 to just gather and pick up uh, 0 0.5. Wouldn't you want to see this and everyone have this without having Lorenzo Damiani written on it? I mean, would you be happy with that? I would actually be happy if uh, I just find it with the writing designer so and so. I mean, uh, no, just to say, I mean, in the long run, nowadays designers want to design to enter in a museum, right? And therefore the name is super important more than the object, right? We're actually, you're designing to solve a problem. And yeah, of course, I'd be super happy if they just produce it without writing my name. No problem. I'd call... Uh, uh, companies that produce brushes, they're just thinking of the boars to eat and... Well, he went to the museum already, so that's what I said, but anyway. There's another object, which is always very simple, and uh, how can I just explain? Well. In the way I design, very, very frequently I say that I'm cannibalizing, I'm stealing some objects that already exist. 
and I transform these into some components of some other objects. And if the element made of glass is already there, why should I redesign it? It's okay, it's already existing. But in this case, I tried to solve a problem because very frequently the vases of this kind with a glass uh, top, they have this rubber element that becomes yellowish, ugly, and from this I created an idea that it's a top that conceptually it's as if the uh, rubber transforms itself into the true top and therefore there is uh, a one unique material in gel which beca becomes the, the top itself and this idea is pretty, um, I like this idea that was uh, very interesting. Go ahead, if you want to explain this. Then I brought in a collection of tiles. Well, sometimes I like to design some objects which are not easy to design. What does this mean? Well, it means that you have to go through a model. This is the case of this, because even if you're very good, in using computer software and so on, I believe that it's almost impossible or very, very hard to predict uh, a deformation of this kind because the folds, unless you insert certain parameters, but it becomes very, very hard because to have some deformation of this kind, you need to understand the type of material, you need to understand the thickness of the section of the tube because the more it's thin, the more it becomes pointy and edgy when you bend it. And uh, um, the same thing is true for these tiles. Collection, this tile connection had a drawing done with a finger. And therefore, if you touch these, you feel the, the material that has been moved. And that's hard to draw. And therefore, also in this case, it's determinant to use materials and knowing how to use it. Well, of course, there were also some other thoughts, technical thoughts here. Well, here I did not design a house, but it's an image that is interesting to say that the technology of solar panels is applied in a way which is a bit quick, too quick. Um, rather, it would be interesting to integrate solar panels that they're, they have been produced since uh, like 10 years or more in a more thin manner. And he created this, uh, I created this, uh, what? Yes, it was in the video. The idea of this object is, well, of course, it's a very simple idea, but there is the will of having people understand that how solar panels can be integrated in a very sober and very hidden manner. There are watches that have solar panels, right? And they have these solar panels that are very present. In this case, the idea was that of integrating some numbers to have a technology which is more sober. Then there's this. Uh, it's a glass that the aesthetics is also functional because on the bottom there, you see it's very functional to transform itself into an aesthetics running through the glass and this is to un open bottles this is a project that was uh, done very many years ago this was done for an exhibition an exhibition very frequently designers are invited in exhibitions and uh, creating some objects some uh, different things then sometimes these projects are then uh, 
like timeless. I just wanted to bring this object because it has generated another object and it speaks pretty much the same language. This is, you know those things that you use just to put glue? Well, usually it's dirty, right? And usually you never know where to clean it, where to put it, right? If you put it down somewhere, it has glue on it and it stays. Rather, with this simple drawing, well, you can place it on the can of glue. Well, this is not the adequate support, uh, but it should be placed on the can of glue. But you have to reason very simply. Well, this should be used uh, to be placed on the can of glue. And it gives an alternative. It improves the use of the object. And also in this case, I believe that few designers have thought of this. Well, the interesting thing is that we'll try to find a designer who will just use his time to do something like this. Not very many designers would dedicate their time to do this, which investigate in niches of a project of this kind. And I still think of Castiglione, well, uh, Giovanna brought uh, the incredible spoon that would get the entire mayonnaise of the vase. Well, this is incredible. You observe the gestures and automatically you understand the function. You can simply solve the problem. Well, a problem of this kind, you just design something to solve this. You can still nowadays design so many things, you just really need to enter those niches where the usual chair is not interesting. You have to keep your eyes open and do the chair sometimes, but also dedicate yourself to these niches because we really need this. What you design the chair, after you sat down, you can actually uh, design other things. I don't know, a brush, a, uh, a spoon, well, anything. These are some objects that originate to avoid the bad words of people who use them and say, oh my God, why didn't everyone think of this? The expressiveness of material? Well, you were speaking about the architect, right? Uh, and uh, saying that, uh, oh, the, excuse me, the, the artisans keep on saying, architect, no, we can do this, we can't do this. And well, the idea was that uh, of using, well, very frequently I use some alternative materials. And in this case, I have an incredible passion for um, wood. And I've used this for very many times. And in this case, I wanted to um, process it and cover it with a transparent um, paint. Usually um, this wood, after it goes on the torque, it's uh, covered with uh, uh, laminated materials, special varnish. All the products that we have are done in MDF, and uh, I did not want to, um, I, wa I did not want to hide the material, and therefore I said, I want to try to do some objects with a technology which is very well known, and therefore it's written in the various uh, manuals using torques and using the usual machinery, and I've used a material which is also very well known, which gives life to some objects which are different. And in this case, well, here you can notice uh, there is the relationship with the artist. Here there is also the fact of um, having an artisan that actually believes in what you're doing. And there is this artisan that tells you, yes, architect, we can do it. This has been definitely the hardest part. And uh, um, it was very interesting to find the correct user. 
Well, I started with this artisan who had this uh, particular sensitivity, and then we said, well, we have to try to find a different method to do the entire collection. And it was a drama. And the architects, no, we cannot do this architect. Oh, no, this is what usually would happen to me. And they kept on saying, no, because this are materials that can ruin all the various materials, the torque, if you don't know how to use it perfectly. It's like a bad word, right? And therefore, in fact, uh, I found this person who used the, the torque, and uh, therefore um, he said, okay, let's play with this. I mean, I think it's pretty interesting, and therefore, um, and therefore it's not so easy for a designer to uh, use the chipboard. And using these hardboard and having uh, an artisan who can process hardboard with the torque is very uh, difficult. And uh, Lorenzo Damiani is definitely a man who's very stubborn. And it is also true that he says, um, I want to do this and so on. And sometimes he's the one saying he's not interested in something. Sometimes different companies ask him uh, to do something. And he says, well, no, this I always feel like doing things, but some things I don't really believe in. Uh, he doesn't believe that it's a correct idea that he can do something like that and uh, and uh, with an actual curve why don't you add a curve why don't you add this to your design he says well i don't share the same idea i don't want to do it uh, like for example avi rubinetteria which he did the joystick uh, uh, tap for well he was asked to do a series of uh, taps for the contract and he decided to do that because that was a pretty interesting project where there was a total thought of optimization of the pre-existing everything they had in their company in terms of uh, different internal mechanisms of these taps and um, he wanted they wanted this tap to uh, work uh, uh, and cost the very little and therefore, the work of the designer here is very, very hidden because if you take a look at the tap itself, well, actually, it's pretty banal. And in the, in the various brief of the project, they told me, well, we do not want this to be customized by you. We just want a tap that works and that is cheap. We just have uh, half an hour, but uh, because you have done very, very many projects. These are the various objects done in hardwood. And, uh, um, well, here there's a relationship between a poor material and a more noble material, which is nutwood. Therefore, there's nutwood and some hardwood um, mixed together. And here you can see how uh, a poor material, like chipboard, hardwood put together and how this could eventually create a uh, rich material. Well, this is another furniture done for very many years. Well, this image, I've inserted it because well, first of all, I've inserted this for uh, Giovanna because she is a geologist and therefore she, of course, said thank you. <laughs> so she said, okay, let's just put this, some extra points, and maybe Giovanna can do another exhibition with me. Besides all these jokes, I like this image which shows how small that machine is uh, or that truck there is imagine it's gigantic if we stand close to this is gigantic but with this image is so small and it means that you're digging 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 to doing some objects in marble that very frequently they consume a lot of material 
And therefore, in 2007, I have created a several collection of furniture totally done in marble, but empty inside. And they're, they're boxed, so this is how it's called. It generates some very light objects and it's not that, of course, it's super light that you can just throw it and it's like a feather, but it's super light compared to the typology. And the first table was done in marble. Then for the exhibition done in Studio Castiglioni, always with the same company, the material was coming from the same company. Well, they've done some different kinds of uh, like sort of benches, stools. And uh, going to their company, I've seen that there were these marble, marble slates that cut very, very thinly. Well, they could be flexible. And why is this so? Because marble, if it's cut so, so thin, it's flexible. Well, of course, it has to, uh, uh, of course, follow some uh, radius of curves, and you have to think of the objects real, real well, but marble becomes flexible. And therefore, he did a marble bench, which is bendable and one folded. So, this structure is in wood, and the lower part is basically the end of the curb of the marble. When no one sits, the marble is straight. When the person sits, the marble goes through a curb. The person can wait 50 kilograms or 200. It doesn't really matter because the structure of the wood ends the curb. Of course, under the marble, there is a very, very thin film of glass fiber that makes this marble flexible. It compacts it when it flexes and curves and avoid it to uh, break. And that uh, was presented always at the same exhibition. That's a very beautiful project. And Establish and Sun has nothing so strong. I know you don't really appreciate what I have said, but uh, you know, sometimes, uh, of course, that was just uh, uh, done, but very many times we look at things done by all these names. Ah, did who does the table for. Well, this object, I mean, I don't know if you do agree, but it has an incredible strength. Nothing like that has been seen. Well, she loves it, of course, but the interesting thing is besides the shape is uh, the emotion that you have when you sit on this. I mean, once you sit on it, well, I remember the first time in reality, the first time I standed on this because I went to the company, we had put uh, uh, some bricks on one side and on the other on the floor. We have positioned that and I stepped on it. And I was a bit afraid not to hurt myself, but to break the material when I said, hey, it's impossible. And I have that sensation and every time I sit, well, actually, the first time I sat on this, uh, I remember in Castiglione, well, very many people had this sensation of, uh, can I sit on this? Rather, uh, we did also some uh, bended marble um, benches. A shape of this kind could be done only with full marble, therefore a full excessive weight marble and therefore with the use of resources that was incredible. This is why I have used several objects of marble, just to make you understand how much we're digging. Rather, actually here it's just a box, the marble, it's just the external faces. Well, I was telling you that this shape could actually be done just with a full piece of marble. 
rather this and this under one are done in the folded marble and therefore it could not be done in any other manner rather in this way bending the marble we managed to do this box thing, shape and you see that he's holding it up and it's definitely not so heavy uh, this is an image when they were pulling this down from the truck and you can see that the guy he's carrying it I mean he's not this is a bench that weighs 70 kilos probably but 70 kilos is a lot but it's two meters and a half and if it was made of paper it would weigh pretty much the same and think about it of course there is a piece of marble it's four millimeters five millimeters of marble that of course weights but if this bench was done with the traditional technologies well of course five people could not raise this i mean you probably need a machinery these are just some experiments I always referred to materials done very many years ago in 1997 and they were some uh, like a collection of lamps done in the street the objects of Campeggi well, I just put a few. They're objects that originate uh, by what happens. This is in my house. I suffer when it's hot. And I like the fan. But living in an apartment, every time, I mean, at a certain point of the year, the fan is taken and then put in, in the... Uh, right. In, March, you don't really want to go uh, in the basement and go get the fan that you have put there in the winter, right? And so you need a fan that can be used and kept in the house without being annoying and therefore changing the plane and the reference. It can become something different. Well, vertically is a fan. Horizontally, it becomes like a little table. And of course, you can just put anything on it. Some people say, yeah, but if you uh, turn on the fan, it's better not to do it. But if you have, uh, of course, something full would not fall. Of course, it's a table you might like or not, but it, functionally, it does work. And uh, it depends according to what you want to do. I have, I like to see inside. In motorbikes, I want to see the engine. In objects, I like to see the structure, and therefore I'm playing with this because I really like it because it's very structural. <laughs> you just, uh, every time that you, you do something, you just show the interior of things, right? Well, you say that uh, objects originate by looking at yourself around. Well, usually the, the, um, people in Triennale were hiding somewhere just to sit down and everything and so I said well why don't we do like a chair that just puts everything together with the logo of the Triennale and this chair Triennale said immediately and then he started doing several things like this object if you go to Triennale there are the firemen who are there walking and never know where to sit and I said well let's do a stool for them post action it's called post azione which was uh, just treated with the same uh, uh, logic of uh, the, the various things used or maybe a lamp to hold the extinguisher these are objects that work for several uh, reasons I mean they have rather speaking about Campeggi well this was present in Giovanna's Castiglioni studio and uh, this is uh, um, a small little uh, armchair, and when you need it, it becomes a ladder. Then it could be a chair, it could be a stool, informal chair, and of course, it should have, uh, to be understood, it should have, uh, I don't know, a bookshelf and something. And the relation is the fact of taking something or else it's a project is for itself but when you have to take an object you understand the use of this this was a mirror and a table uh, 
it's a mirror of 160, 180, very big, that you can detach from the wall, and it becomes a table. What was interesting that when I presented this, I did not think of the possibility of having this become a, a mirror for the floor, and the idea was given from a person at the Salone Satellite. When he put it on the floor, ah, he said, hi, I like it with this shape. And he never thought of that. But very frequently, you have to be capable of uh, understanding several ideas because a project sometimes you you work on it so much that some things you just miss out on so it's very nice to just share these projects and now you became like the, the master of the transform though. maybe it's the wrong word but uh, of this kind of design that campeggi is definitely the ideal company right it's their mission the find of looking for these multitasking objects. This is an object that originates from several times. That was part of the collection. It should go back there. Giovanna Castigliani, the performer. Well, after having uh, uh, drank a bit of wine, of course I could do it for five minutes, but now no. I've fallen in love with this because it's like going back to being a kid. I mean, this was my cigarette when I was a kid since my dad was always smoking. I used to play with these. And therefore, well, this project was very interesting and I liked it so much, this relation that you create uh, with uh, the unknown user who would use this. You never know who will buy these projects that you do and that you love and uh, uh, you always follow until the end. But rather, in this case, the fun thing is that both the kid as well as the 18 years old man for sure he wants to clean the house and second I mean there's no trick you have to do it and this is a project well of course it's a poof that it's a vacuum cleaner the idea is looking around at what happens around the house well who has a vacuum cleaner well at the end you have to put it back somewhere right this is hiding emphasizing at the same time so on the presence of the object well this was automatically hidden this is a logic of hiding emphasizing that very frequently i have used in my projects and well the idea of of course how giovanna was saying well this is a vacuum cleaner you have this ball that follows you because it's suspended by the air which enters on one side and exits on the other clear right well i liked the idea of managing and using the last breath of this vacuum cleaner so he was continuing to uh find a way to use this. I was playing with my uh, nephew and we threw uh, a ball on this vacuum cleaner and he saw this ball that just uh, did this strange movement and fell on the floor. What happens? Well, in that case, yes, I said, hey, what a nice idea. Not because, because I was already thinking of something like that. And therefore, in this sense, I just reconnect myself to what we were saying before of the inspiration. It's always a work of research. There's a nice book of where do ideas originate in these moments where you have already elaborated a few things and then you have uh, that bit where everything comes back and you're like, hey, there's a project. This is the Nomad office. It's a hybrid project as well because um, it's a project that goes between an environment and uh, an object. It's a project for industrial spaces which reasons with the same kind of technology and build with 
um, different environments that could actually be from the Abitacolo of Munari to Lorenzo Damiano. Very good. He has done something like 100 projects or more. Projects, ideas. He has done very, very many in his career, in his 20 years of work. I'm sorry to tell you and remind you that you're a bit old. And he has done a selection of so the game now could be that of seeing what has been left out and that was very strong, very intelligent. Very many things have been left out. I want you. This is the moment of the questions, but uh, at least my students, they are forced to ask questions. Or else we will continue for five more minutes. Or... Of course, the question, you get a better grade, right? So go ahead, ask these questions. Uh, your grade. No, just, just, I believe that uh, his uh, design, the fact that he looks at different objects, I took a few notes, uh, he, he has uh, a view that is just turning things around, he has the particularity of like, this match, and he gives you like the surprise with intelligence, just like he used to do, uh, like Achille Castiglione used to do, because it's not that limited gesture. It's an intelligence which is imprinted on the objects, just like here. Where is the project? Well, of course there is a project, but it's invisible. This is why probably the companies have a hard time in understanding all these things and other material, but maybe they understand better. If you add this thing, but that just turns around the entire matter, they might say, oh, well, we don't know, we think about it, no thank you. There, you really need to understand. Well, you're a designer of like a patent office. This is not an offense, actually. Well, the designer has to do like an up and down between his office, his studio, and his patent, and the patent office where you deposit the patent for your idea, your invention. Curiosity before? And uh, if you're not curious, just forget about it. And then, uh, and uh, this is what Achille used to say. And uh, you have to go uh, understand the gestures and solve those with simplicity, without building anything, emphasizing and underlining structures, never hiding anything. And also Achille Castiglione used to love to show all these things in their project. The project is there. There's no instructions for your objects they speak to you you know exactly what you have in front i remember that when i was with achille castiglione and i asked him several questions and he said but hey sorry i asked a banal question like how do you understand when you need a stop which is not so banal and he said saying hey and that's it And that's it. I don't know. Do you, are there any questions? You can ask questions to Joanna if you want. My students. Okay. Or else I just call you, okay? Twenty-eight. What surprises me is this one. <laughs> 
continuity of these questions. Okay, and you like the, the object for me, I don't remember the name before. Uh, for? Uh, I, I, my question was very really simple. It's just, you, how, you, how, you, how, you, how you discover that this is simplicity? You were painting, you, you were making the, the action, or you, how, how you discover this guy that it's simple, and that simple idea function of those objects? What project are you talking about? It was in really clear. Sta parlando sempre del pennello eh, messo insieme all'arnese per aprire la latta. Come, come hai fatto a pensare a un'idea del genere? Cioè stavi pitturando casa? Stavi... Oppure da dove è nata? Torno nel gabbiotto, scusa. Well, working a lot with my hands i mean well uh these are all experiences that we all have uh, worked in and therefore thinking that at a certain point i wanted to use a brush and what were the problems related to that <laughs> see there's the idea and it turns on Well, probably this is uh, one of the ideas besides the fact that it's the first one it's one of the oldest and so on because I'm uh, definitely very affectionate to this because it's one of my first ideas but it reminds me a nice period of my life but I believe that it's the nicest thing to see an old project and say hey I'd redo it the same way that's nice because of course sometimes I just um, look at some other projects and I think and I say well there was once where there was a period where I had done so many without really concluding anything and I used to say oh my god these people are not understanding they're not I'm, I'm not winning these competition it's the usual friends that always but then I realized looking at the objects that I was presenting well they should actually send me on a like a desert island I mean the things that I was presenting were horrible to go back to this, rather, it's very nice, actually, to see some of your projects that you see years from when you have designed them, and you're happy you've designed them. Other questions? We don't really have to force you guys to questions, but almost. Ah, a 30 for her. 30, who wants a 30? The project of the bench and made in marble. Have you done some trials? Also, because I have never seen anything like that with marble in that way. You have said, like the fear of sitting on it and it breaks. Well, I wanted to understand how did you understand that that was the curve? What was the approach that you have had with the material? Well, the approach is very simple. Well, you have to put bricks. Well, I believe there are some projects that you need to do with the material in your hands. And therefore, it originates with taking these bricks, we put them on the floor, starting from a specific height, with the floor that was basically the end, right, of the curve, and just slowly rising the bricks. Before they were too big, too tall, we removed, got lower and lower, because of course, uh, it would start, you would start to feel some cracks, some noises that would suggest not to exaggerate. Rather, that was a flexion that was had to be certain, and therefore, starting from this system, we have uh, uh, done some wooden molds to recreate the structure. 
of course, there was a project that was aesthetic at the same time, right? Going at the same speed with this. And then we created this wooden sort of structure. And then we have put an MDF and we have seen it worked. And then we, uh, the first time we realized that we had to modify the curve, we modified that, and we'll, of course, put all the information together, and the bench was created. Well, actually, I went to them, and they showed me a few things. They showed me several things, several possibilities that could actually uh, be done with marble. And then they showed me retroilluminated marble. And at a certain point, they showed me this sheet of marble. And they said, ah, oh, this can be folded. But uh, they couldn't really find an application for that because they realized the possibility of uh, doing these curves when it's cut and they have to transport it. And they realized that this is a great problem. But after they said, but well, maybe it could be used in some way. And therefore, they could not manage how this could be done. And therefore, at the end, they've done these objects. But what happens? Well, these objects originated also from the curiosity of going to search for different things. And if you don't go in the right places, going and just spending time in a studio, well, you will not find the things that uh, you need to do research, you need to experiment. An artisan of marble uh, sees marble every day and he considers these problems. I mean, a problem for someone can be an actual strength for a project for someone else. You get a 30. I don't really know, actually. We always have to be very, very careful in doing all this. Uh, some materials also in an alternative manner. Also, the fact of thinking of an alternative use of a material can give life to some projects which are uh, different and can give some new functionality. Like, for example, the fact of using hardwood in an alternative manner gave life 
to some functionality that um, and some shapes that were very, very particular. Very frequently when you use materials, you have to try to create some shapes that are tuned in with the material. This collection is characterized some some very, very curvy shapes, not because formally I like these shapes, but they were shapes that um, could be given by this material. If you work on this, well, the fact of creating these shapes, which are very big and very important, depends on the type of material that you're using. On the functionality, well, basically, this, for example, starting from the idea of wanting to use marble, which is flexible and foldable, well, I did some benches. Well, also, in this case, the measurements and the bendable marble, I'm taking this as an example, it allows you to have uh, some very broad uh, curve. And therefore, this input gives you a strong idea on the object you can design. Well, if you think you want to do like a bowl, that's very, very hard. And from there, the idea of designing some benches, because it's possible to do some curves that could actually show the possibility of this material. Well, just as soon as you get some ideas, you need a mix of different possibilities of opportunities I say this game this game that he has done with the reuse of leftovers well that is incredible when I've seen that project I was uh, um, totally surprised because Lorenzo Damiani which is so careful to details he does a decorative object and then you see it you look at it you see the name um, and then there you discover an entire world of the project which was incredibly done to reuse some leftovers. Same thing right here. You have this, well okay, there's some leads, but he has the ironic element and does that a luminous net. Well, uh, of course, you, you can think of something like that, but you haven't. Are there any other questions? No. Okay. <laughs> Let me come out so to make sure. Allora, te la traduco in simultanea e così non abbiamo problemi. Inside, there is an alveolar structure. Scusa. Inside, there is an alveolar structure. And it has this structure that keeps everything together. And it has to create uh, um, the structural uh, bearing weight. And it also creates uh, the, the lightness due to the fact that it's alveolar. And then some glues that keeps it together. Yes, of course, it's not totally hollow. It has this structure. And so that the people who sit don't break anything. Um, well, that project, of course, had some other uh, small uh, parts that I had to tell you. It can be transported by one person with a cart. Well, uh, those are several other things. Well, due to the fact that all these people do not come to the studio, and due to the fact Yes, of course, we have to redo all this. Since it's very, very late, just one minute, just to say one more thing. Thank you very much to Giovanna. Uh, I want to start with her. She's a lady to have reminded us of the figure of Achille Castiglione. Uh, 
and with uh, the work she does with her foundation. And thank you very, very much for being here tonight. For her research, and with the passion that for so many years he does design. And uh, the world of design that it's full of sharks perversion and uh, perversion in projects. I want to read just two lines from a text of uh, Becca Finesti, which is contained in this booklet, which is the catalog of the exhibition, we, because I believe the words are very good. And it says, well, he is 40 years old, but now his head is still. And he's a um, nice guy, but he does just what he wants. He never winks his eye to the companies and doesn't bow towards them. They need to understand who he is. Achille Castiglione had already smiled to him, had already sustained him, has already prized him, and today he'd do it again. <laughs> 